Welcome to The Forgotten, Episode 1, Introduction. Otto von Bismarck once said, the main thing is to make history, not to write it. Over the course of decades, centuries and millennia, thousands and thousands of people have made history, with Bismarck himself of course being the candidate for German number one in a distinct period of it. While he's one of the people better known to the broad masses, at least in Europe, and to an even bigger extent of course in Germany, many people who have managed to perform no less significant feats are not as present in the popular interest. Politicians, artists, generals, scientists, who have changed the world as we know it dozens of times, are pushed behind some major figureheads, depending on where you live. In Europe, most people have heard about Napoleon. Certainly, everyone was taught in school about Hitler. And Americans are endeared to George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. But where do we draw the line? Where do we believe people to be forgotten? This expression is probably as catchy as hyperbolic, but why is the popular demand for information about a certain person so low or so high? It's pretty hard to draw a line here. As Mike Duncan, the mastermind behind the history of Rome, stated in his podcast while talking about Bishop Ambrose of Milan, history is a tandem drive between socio-economic factors and makers. Single people who have advanced our understanding of certain matters, our attitude towards certain issues, or our treatment of certain situations, either to their own or the public's good. And, while doing this, spinning the narrative we have come to love or hate as history. While this statement is a very simple understanding, it pretty much sums up what I want to talk about. I want to talk about these makers. About the makers the public cares little about, to be precise. While I understand that there is, as I have already stated, little interest in them, I do believe that knowledge about them is essential for getting into the nitty-gritty details of their certain periods, and most certainly for recognizing the effect this certain period had on our lives. Their lives, like those of countless others, have impacted our times, maybe even our ideologies and ways of life, very deeply. While most people know so little, or only half-true popular stories about them, like the vision of Constantine at the Milvian Bridge, I am, of course, always very open to suggestions on new people. It is, of course, nearly impossible to separate the forgotten from the popular canon of history completely. Many events we will come across are well known, as the Battle of Waterloo, for example. I shall see how big of an interest in these events there is, and I shall deal with them accordingly. If popular demand wills it, I will construct a platform for everyone to exchange ideas and, of course, correct me on any mistake I might make. For a start, I will put the focus on my own homeland, Germany, or rather its major predecessor state, the Kingdom of Prussia. During this tour, we will accompany a young man born in the fifth year of the Seven Years' War in 1760, named August Wilhelm Anton Neidhardt, to become known to the world as August von Gneisenau. While we follow his early life, his early military career and his rise to power, we will pass by several events that have changed the face of the earth, like Jena and Auerstedt in 1806, the heroic defense of Kohlberg in 1807, the great Prussian military reforms starting with the Peace of Tilsit in 1807, the coalition wars in Germany, which we Germans call the Befreiungskriege, the Wars of Liberation, culminating of course in the Battle of Waterloo. While certain events of this, mostly the Prussian reforms and the Peace of Tilsit, will be looked upon in detail later on throughout the journey through Napoleonic Europe, I do not want to simply look at Gneisenau as a soldier and official, but also at the person to characterize a maker, to see what was going on in his head. This will be possible by accessing his enormous amount of letters, of which an incredible amount has been retained and published for everyone to read. Everyone who speaks German, that is. I'll heavily rely on biographies, especially the massive five-volume biography by Hans Delbrück. I do understand that, as with the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Gibbon, 
The book is dated, and its first publication is already 138 years ago as I'm starting this podcast. But as major parts of his work consist of letters, I do believe there's a lot salvageable to it. I furthermore want to disclaim that I'm not a historian. I am aspiring to be one, and I had the great luck of having a very supportive father considering this. I'm just a guy who reads lots and lots of books and had lots of military history lessons at officer school and uses the time until he passes out of active service to prepare for his history studies, which will start next year. I do not really consider anything I say to be the 100% truth and I will of course be available for any reasonable discussion about any topic. Where does Gneisen now come from? Many details about his early life are unknown. For this early phase I will rely heavily on Gerhard Thieles, Gneisenau, Life and Opus of the Royal Prussian Field Marshal, a chronicle, which is an excellent, if a little dry, piece on him. What we know for certain is that he was born on the 27th of October 1760 in the little town of Schildau, today Belgan Schildau, in Saxony. His father, August Wilhelm Neithardt, an officer in the artillery train of the Reichsarmee, the army of the many German states who sided with Austria in the Seven Years' War, left his wife there during the campaigns in Saxony, which ultimately led to the Battle of Torgau on the 3rd of November. His mother, Eva Maria Neithardt, was daughter to a wealthy Catholic Württembergian lieutenant colonel, who did not take her marriage to a poor Protestant artillery lieutenant, which he had come to know as he was stationed in the house, too kindly. His father had studied architecture, which did not really qualify him for the jobs an artillery train officer had to do. We do not know how well he did, but what we know is that he had risen from the ranks to lieutenancy in just two years. However, Gneisenau's mother died when little August was not even a year old. The reasons for her early death are not known. August the Elder, obviously shocked by this tragedy, had no opportunity to care for his infant son and gave him away for the time of the war. The first family who took on Gneisenau for the better part of six years, which sounds kinda wrong if you remember that the war ended in 1762 with the peace of Hubertusburg, is not remembered by history. What we do know is that Gneisenau lived those years in poverty. He remembers himself that he did not have soles on his shoes, but at least always a piece of black bread to eat. In 1767, Gneisenau moved in with his wealthy grandparents to Würzburg in today's Bavaria. Imagine what a sight it must have been for the six to seven year old boy. Würzburg, a city with over 15,000 inhabitants at that time, was bustling with activity. The city had grown wealthy from its position on the Rhine and by trading and producing high quality wine. It was, at that time, ruled by the Fürstbischof, the Prince Archbishop, whose opulent residence is still open for visit today. If you should happen to come to the area we Germans call Mainfranken, check it out. Gneisenau lived in opulent, centuries old mansion right next to the university and you can guess that he remembers it to be quite an upgrade to his earlier life. I am terribly sorry not being able to give you a marvelous rags to riches story as people like to hear it. Although his father was an impoverished noble, his mother's family was very wealthy, and he spent the second half of his childhood in a nice and cozy, warm home, and almost certainly with soles on his shoes. His early years, especially his early education, already shows a person who struggles with the common practices of his time. While he gets taught by Jesuits and Franciscans, a friend of the family, a professor, introduces him to classical literature, the Iliad and the Odyssey. The superstitious and boring lessons of the friars make him flee into the words of Achilles and the authors of antiquity, which, as has to be remarked, were already translated into German. As he says himself, his later love to literary works stems from this. It has to be noted here that Gneisenau learned Latin, but the lessons were absolutely terrible. He states that he was to learn the songs of Virgil by heart, but the monk who taught him did not understand them himself, which, of course, sounds just like Latin class in my home state of North Rhine-Westphalia. He forgot most of what he had learned after only a few short years. Young Gneisenau had a very melancholic soul. When his grandfather died in 1771, he was cared for by his aunt, Eva Margarete Müller, 
who was a woman of the world, speaking English, French and Italian, and granting young August access to all of the current literature. Still living in Würzburg, he remembers watching the stream, it is the Rhine, flow and thinking of America and Indian, making war there, colonizing and founding cities. His time living in the city was cut short when Aunt Margarete married a Bedonian captain in 1773. They moved to Schwäbisch Gmünd, a little town in Baden. Gneisenau was not too happy with the change of scene. Lucky for him, his father takes him to Erfurt, which might quite probably be the first time he sees him in his life, although this can't be stated for certain, as the sources are dubious at best. The father, now military architect in the services of the Archbishopric of Mainz after being relieved of his duties at the end of the war, was a personal favorite to the local minister Karl von Dahlberg, a pretty interesting person in his own right, and was promoted to the city's head construction manager and remarried in 1772. He fathered four more children, three boys and a daughter. Gnasenau himself switches to a Catholic gymnasium, which is a great boon to his education. Four years later, he joins the University of Erfurt, studying architecture and focusing on military mathematics. But young August is not really a diligent student. He's more the guy for fencing, horse riding and of course good old carousing. Inevitably he breaks off his studies after just one year. His father, not worthy enough to feed him through and not even willing to spend all his money on the binging son, doesn't want to support him. This leads to the first step in the direction of the Gneisenau we are going to know and hopefully know of. In 1778, August joins the army, the Austrian army, that is, and he actually goes to war against Prussia. Although this sounds like a major irony of history, the war we are talking about is the War of Bavarian Succession, which was caused by the extinction of the Bavarian House of Wittelsbach and lasted for only about a year, with no major engagements fought. In Germany, this war is known as the Kartoffelkrieg, the Potato War, because all the Prussians had to eat was potatoes, introduced into Prussia by Frederick II only a few years prior. There's a funny German folk tale to it, and if you care for it, I'll gladly share with you. Anyways, the war ended with minor territorial gains for the Prussians and the Austrians, yes, you heard that right, and the elector of Palatinate was set on the Bavarian throne. Nonetheless, after a year of service, Gneisen now leaves the Austrian army. Some say out of boredom, but most say because he was involved in several duels with some other soldiers. It is to be said that he was not an officer. However, on personal recommendation of Minister Dahlberg, or maybe Zorn's new husband, he joined the Ansbach Bayreuth Jäger Regiment in the city of Ansbach. There his talent, but probably also his relations, were duly noted. Joining as a cadet, he quickly rises up to be an ensign, becoming an officer in 1781. I want to take another look at the melancholic side of young August. As I already said, he seems to be a very thoughtful, brooding type of person, if he's not drinking in one of the taverns of Erfurt, that is, and very well educated in the terms of literature. Every German who might listen to this will quite probably be familiar with the name of Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, Lessing, for every one of you who did not have to enjoy Emilia Galotti or Der zerbrochene Krug, translated literally, The Broken Jug, was a German poet living from 1729 to 1781, a great proponent of the Bürgerliches Trauerspiel, bourgeois drama, sorry for the amount of German words, usually thematizing an unpolitical family story and turning it into a display of conflict between the righteous and gentile bourgeoisie and the corrupt and decadent nobility. When the poet died, young Gneisner was heartbroken. In the earlier mentioned book by Thiele, there's a quote from a poem he wrote when he heard of his death. Out of the earth's round circles, to higher purpose, up to higher lights, my spirit rose, already willing to travel, to tracks unknown by this earth and sun. The will of the creator selected, be where you want to be, a spirit like yours, was predestined to higher dignity. <sighs> if this is not melancholic, I really, really do not know what is. 
I wish to end this first episode on this poetic note. But I do not want to leave without saying that I hope you enjoyed this first little step on our little journey. Hopefully it's gonna be the first of many journeys. Next time we shall start with Gneisenau seeing real combat when he leaves Europe for the War of American Independence. I wish you a good day or a good night. See you next time.